Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh We begin the tafsir of surah number 53 of the Holy Quran known as surah al-Najm Now before we begin with the first few verses of the surah I'd like to give you a little bit of background about this chapter Now surah al-Najm sequentially in the way that it's laid out in the Quran it's surah number 53 However, chronologically, there is a discussion among the Mufassirin of the Qur'an as to whether it's an early Meccan surah or is it a late Meccan surah. However, when you look at the verses of this surah, if we assume that it was revealed at one time, this surah was revealed shortly after the Mi'raj because Verses 13 to 18 speak about the Holy Prophet's nightly ascension. So we can guess that this surah was during the Meccan period when the Prophet was at an all-time low in, his, in the propagation of his message in Mecca. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in order to boost his morale, he experiences this Mi'raj. Now, the name of the surah, Surah Al-Najm, which literally means the star, it takes its name from the first ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a qasan. He makes an oath. He swears by the star when it sets. Now, some of the commentators say that this was the first surah of the Qur'an that was recited publicly. You know, if you look at the, the biography of the Holy Prophet, if you look at the 23 years of his mission, the first three years in Mecca, Islam was a private invitation. The Prophet was meeting with people in secret. Then three years after the Ba'tha, Allah reveals that famous ayah, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ Now the Holy Prophet is instructed to invite members of his family and his extended family, his tribe, the Bani Hashim, the clan. So therefore you find that for the first few years, the surahs that were being revealed were only shared with select individuals. They were recited by Rasulullah in private gatherings, in secret. But with Surat and Najm, some commentators have said that this is the first surah that was recited in a public domain, whereby believers and non believers are able to hear it. Now, Surat and Najm is one of the most famous chapters in the Quran. You know, if you look at many of the Qurra, the reciters of Qur'an, many of those who recite Tajweed, this is a favorite among many of the reciters of the Qur'an because Surat Al-Najm is unique because of its poetic rhetorical power. You know, there are some verses in the Qur'an that have less rhythm than others. This surah is unique because the content and the style and the rhythm of the surah is very attractive to the eye. That's why Surah Al-Najm is a surah that's very easy to memorize because it's a surah of exquisite literary beauty. It has 62 verses. Now, you may think that 62 verses means that it's a pretty long surah, but on the contrary, many of the verses of this surah are actually very, many of the verses of this surah are actually very short. So it's a relatively short surah, but we have 62 verses. Now, if you look at the surah from the beginning to the end, you can divide the surah into seven main sections. So let me give you a quick overview of Surah Al-Najm and inshallah we'll transition to a more in-depth discussion. So Surah Al-Najm has six themes or six sections. The first is 
the first few verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes an interesting connection between the stars and the revelation of the Holy Quran. Two things that seemingly have nothing in common. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the star when it sets, and then Allah has a conversation about the Quran and the credibility of the Holy Prophet. So after swearing by the star and when it sets, Allah initiates a conversation about the Quran. So the commentators say that there is a link, there is an interconnectivity between this qasam, the star, the stars and the revelation of the Quran. So this is the first section. Then the Quran, in the next few verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for example, in verses 13 to 18, as I mentioned earlier, Allah speaks about a very mysterious event in the life of the Prophet, known as the Mi'raj. Now this is an event whereby the Holy Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, is made to witness some of the spiritual realities, some of the great signs of the kingdom of God's creation. The story of Mi'raj represents the closest encounter between the creator and the created. So the Mi'raj, inshallah, we'll speak more about it, in the second part, section of the surah, there is a conversation about this unique event, which highlights the spiritual status of the Holy Prophet as a human being, as a servant of God, who was able to reach the highest level of proximity to his Lord. He was able to experience God, experience the presence of the divine, in a way that no one before him and no one after him will ever experience. Then in the third section of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses some of the corrupt beliefs and practices of the pagans. Now, it's important for us to bear in mind that when Allah speaks about corrupt beliefs and corrupt practices, religious beliefs, systems of living, philosophies that are based on whim. We're not only talking about a specific group. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically criticizing anyone who has a belief or a practice that is not based on rational argument, that's not based on reason, that's based solely on whim and desire. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticizes the Quraysh for taking angels as deities, for worshipping idols. And there is a, a discussion about the corrupt beliefs and practices. Then in the fourth section of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about repentance. And the idea here is that no matter how far you stray from the path, no matter how many sins you accumulate, no matter how many times you transgress, no matter how stubborn you were in your past, the door of Tawbah is always open. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He doesn't have a grudge against His creation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the moment someone acknowledges their wrongdoing and wants to return and get back in the good grace of His Lord, Allah says, this door is always open. No matter what crime you've committed, the greatest crime is to lose hope in my mercy. And therefore, this door, this gate of Tawbah is always open. Then the fifth theme of the surah, the fifth section, Allah speaks about ma'ad. He speaks about life after death. He speaks about the hereafter. And interestingly, when Allah seeks to prove the existence of the hereafter, He points our attention 
to the phenomenon of resurrection in this life. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala essentially is saying that if you don't, if you doubt the phenomenon of life after death, look around you. Every moment I am bringing things to life after they have died in dunya, in this life. In the winter time, the vegetation dies, the earth is dead, it's devoid of life. And then that same earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down the rain, the sun begins to shine, the temperature rises, and then you see this same environment, this same habitat that was devoid of any life is now teeming with life. It's now completely occupied by organisms, by vegetation. So Allah says this phenomenon of bringing things back to life is happening before your eyes. So why do you doubt that it will happen after you perish? In the sixth section of this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala invites us to reflect upon the destruction of former civilizations. You know, brothers and sisters, you know, when we think about where we are as a society, we think about our technological advances. Allah in the Quran frequently mentions Thamud, the, the people of Ad. He mentions Fir'aun. He mentions the superpowers of the past to teach us that there were superpowers in the past that were destroyed because of their iniquities. The way that you survive as a civilization, it's not through your military, it's not through your technology. When you reach the point of rebellion, when, when there is total moral decay, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this will inevitably lead to your destruction. So Allah is implicitly reminding us not to repeat the mistakes of past nations. And then finally, the last ayah, the last part of the surah is a command for us to prostrate in order to seek nearness to him. Now it's interesting that if you look at the beginning of the surah, Allah speaks about the falling of a star, the setting of a star, and the ayah ends with a command to go down. So the, the ayah begins with a star descending, and the surah begins with a command for us to mirror the falling of that star, the setting of that star through the act of sujood. So when najmi idha hawa, hawa means to go down, to descend, Sujood is basically a human going down and lowering themselves before their Lord in humility. Now, there are two ahadith that I'd like to share with you before we begin with the first ayah, where the Ahlul Bayt, السلام, they speak about the, world, the worldly benefits of reciting and studying the surah and the spiritual benefits. You see, the beauty of the Quran is that the Qur'an is kareem. Kareem can mean noble and it can also mean generous. The Qur'an is unique because it's a book that offers you benefit in this life and also benefit in the hereafter. So the benefits that we derive from the Qur'an can be experienced in dunya even before the akhirah. So there are worldly benefits from the Qur'an and there are also spiritual benefits to the Holy Quran. So there's a hadith that says, Man qara'a surat al-najm, whoever recites surat al-najm, u'atiya min al-ajri ashra hasanat, whoever recites this surah will receive 10 rewards bi'adadi man saddaqa bi Muhammadin wa man jahad bi. You will receive 10 rewards multiplied by all people who believed in the Holy Prophet and all those 
who rejected the Holy Prophet. So you see that the idea here is that there is an exponential reward for those who dedicate time to studying this word. So this is a ukhrawi benefit, a spiritual benefit. Imam al-Sadiq interestingly mentions a dunyawi benefit to reciting Surah An-Naj. He says, Man kana yudminu wa-naj, Whoever yudmin, whoever makes it a habit of reciting Surah An-Naj, fi kulli yawmin, or fi kulli layla. Now, I have, I, have, I have never tried this, but if someone, the Imam السلام, says, if someone recites Surah An-Naj daily, you don't miss it. You develop the discipline of reciting this surah every day or every night. Meaning it becomes a part of your daily routine. The Imam السلام, he says, Asha Mahmudan Bainan Nas. You will be someone who is praised by people. And God will forgive you your transgressions. So the Imam mentions that you will be praised among people. You will be Mahmud and Bain and Nas. You will be forgiven for your sins. Wakana Muhabbaban Bain and Nas. That you will be beloved to people. Meaning that one of the benefits, one of the worldly benefits of this surah, if you if it's recited on a daily basis or a nightly basis, is that Allah will make the hearts inclined to you that you will become someone who is beloved you know how there's some people they're just likable you know you you meet with them you talk with them there is a magnetism to them you want to be around them you enjoy their presence the imam says the one who recites the surah on a regular basis allah will give you this gift you know all of these things are Gifts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is one of the worldly benefits of reciting this surah. Now let us begin with the first ayah. Allah says, When najmi idha hawa, by the star when it sets. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is making an oath. And Allah in the Holy Quran, He swears by many things. You know, there are some Surahs where Allah swears by the sun. We also know that Allah swears by the, the day. Allah swears by the night. Allah swears by the dawn. Here Allah, and Allah swears by things that have significance. There's a reason why Allah is swearing by these things. He wants to draw our attention to them. You know, brothers and sisters, it's interesting that Allah swears by you know, the star, the sun, the day. He swears by these ayat. And it's unfortunate that we live in a time where we are so distracted from the signs in His creation. You know, most of us, we spend our lives looking at the screen on our phones we're looking at the tv we're constantly preoccupied with these technological devices the ipads the phones that were totally alienated from god's creation we're completely disconnected from these ayat allah wants us to be connected to his creation because through his creation we can know him when najmi idha hawa the word najm has three main usages in the quran you know it's very tempting whenever you see the word najm to assume that oh allah is talking about stars however let me give you a couple of examples where the word najm is used, but it's not necessarily referring to stars in the generic sense. So, for example, in Surat An-Nahl, 
Surah 16, ayah number 16, Allah swears by the heavenly stars. So this is an example of the word Najm actually referring to those celestial bodies, the stars in the generic sense. Where Allah says, وَعَلَامَاتٍ وَبِالنَّجْمِهُمْ يَهْتَدُونَ Allah swears by the stars because the stars are used for guidance. You know, in the past, when people used to, you know, sail the ships, especially at night, when the Arabs used to travel in the open desert at night, you know, they didn't have any maps. They didn't have a compass. Their compass were the stars. So when they are in darkness, they used to look at the stars to give them guidance, to allow them to find their way. So the first usage of the word Najm in the Quran is those celestial bodies that we see when we look at the sky, especially at night. Number two, the word Najm sometimes in the Quran is used to refer to vegetation. For example, in Surah Ar-Rahman, what does Allah say? Surah 55, ayah number 6. وَالنَّجْمُ وَالشَّجَرُ يَسْجُدَانِ In this ayah, Najm, according to many commentators of the Qur'an, refers to vegetation without stalks. So you have the vegetation that grows close to the ground, and then you have trees. So Allah is saying, vegetation whether they are without stalks or the trees they both prostrate to me because in the same way that this the stars in the sky appear suddenly when you plant seeds in the ground and you water the seed the buds sprout in the same way it's almost as though the stars sprout when they're in the sky their light appears out of nowhere spontaneously. The plants sprout forth. They rise from the earth in the same way that the stars rise at night. And sometimes, number three, sometimes the Quran uses the word Najm and it's talking about a specific star. So the first was Najm in its generic sense, a reference to stars in general. Number two, Najm is referring to vegetation that grows low to the ground, that doesn't have bark, that doesn't have a trunk or a stalk. And then you see that number three, the word Najm is used to refer to a specific star. In Surah 86, ayah number three, what does Allah say? And Najm thaqib the piercing star. And the commentators, they mention that this is a reference to Pleiades, which is a specific star that appears in the night that is much brighter in comparison to the other stars. Now, the most plausible, now in this context, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to many commentators, is speaking about the heavenly stars. When Najmi Ida Hawa. Now, the word Hawa, so this is the literal meaning of Naj, and I'll speak about the esoteric meaning of Naj. Because sometimes Allah, in one word, He conveys both. He speaks about the literal star and its setting, and there's also the metaphorical meaning that is intended. You know, so for example, if you look at Surah Ash-Shams, Washamsi wa duhaha, Allah swears by the sun. It's the source of life. Wal qamari idha talaha, and Allah then swears by the moon. These are the literal meanings, but there are also esoteric meanings. There are commentators that say Washamsi wa duhaha is a reference to the Prophet. In the same way, the physical sun gives life to the inhabitants of the earth. The Holy Prophet gives spiritual life to the inhabitants of the earth. His teachings revive and give life to the hearts. 
والقمر إذا تلاها the moon reflects the light of the sun and the esoteric meaning is that Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam reflects the light of Muhammad ibn Abdullah. So when the sun sets, when the Holy Prophet dies, there is the moon, which is a reflection of that prophetic light. So you see that these words also are, are symbols for important spiritual realities. So I'll speak in a few moments about what is the metaphorical meaning of Naj. But before that, the Quran says, When Najmi Ida Hawa, by the star when it sets. Now in Arabic, you may be familiar with the word Hawa. You know, the word Hawa means desire. You know, and it doesn't have positive connotations. It usually has negative connotations. So you have Hawa and the present tense verb is Yahwa. Hawa, Yahwa means desire or to desire. And then we have Hawa, Yahwi, which means to fall, to descend, to set. Now here, obviously, when Najmi Ida Hawa, it's not talking about desire. It's talking about the setting of the star. Now, some of the commentators of the Quran, they say that Najm here, at least the esoteric meaning, is that the star is a reference to the Quran. In the same way, that the stars guide you in times of darkness. The Quran is a book of guidance and it guides humanity when they are in states of darkness. So in the same way that the Arabs used to look up at the sky to navigate through the desert or to navigate in the darkness of the night, in the sea, the Qur'an helps us and aids us in navigating through life, through the darkness that we experience in life. Now, stars are heavenly. They're above us. And the Qur'an is also heavenly. The Qur'an is heavenly in its essence. It's not a book that was written or authored by people of this dunya, by earthly people. It was a book whose source is heavenly. In the same way the stars are in the heavens, the Quran, the source of the Quran is heavenly. Now, the Arabs, if you look at classical Arabic, the Arabs used the word Najm to refer to anything that appears in progressive installments, something that appears gradually. The Arabs would use the word Najm or Nujum, Najama, meaning something that comes gradually, something that comes in installments. Now, so Allah is speaking about the star. And we said that some commentators say that it's the Qur'an. The star sets, it descends. You know, stars, they appear and then they descend, they set. If we say that Najm is a reference to the Qur'an, where is the Qur'an descending? by the star when it sets. The Qur'an sets in the heart of the Holy Prophet. By the star when Najmi Ida Hawa, the star sets, but the metaphorical star known as the Qur'an 
sets and comes from that heavenly realm. And the only place that it can come down to, the only place that has the capacity to receive it, to be its receptacle, to be its vessel, is the heart of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks about the Qur'an, he reminds us that for the Qur'an to descend from a heavenly realm to this earthly realm, it's not something that's easy. The Qur'an is something that is very weighty. If you go to Surah Al-Hash, Surah 59, Ayah number 21, what does Allah say? لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لرأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله. Allah in Surah 59, Ayah number 21, He illustrates the weight and the magnitude of the Quran, of this message, in the following example. He says, if this Quran were to have been sent down to, if it was sent down upon a mountain. Now, mountains are majestic. Mountains, you know, we imagine them to be powerful. Allah says, if the Quran was revealed upon a mountain, the mountain would crumble and it would be humbled. Meaning, the, the mountain with its size, with its immensity, with its, with, its mag with, with its majestic nature, does not have the capacity to hold the weight of the Qur'an. Which means the heart of the Prophet has more capacity than the mountains. In Surah 73, Ayah number 5, Allah tells the Prophet, that inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. O Muhammad, indeed, we will cast upon you a weighty word. The Quran, brothers and sisters, is the final book. This is the book that is intended to guide all human beings in all parts of the world, in every generation until the day of judgment. And the Prophet has to deliver this message. The Prophet has to be the living representation of this book. It's a huge responsibility that is placed on the shoulders of the Messenger. That's why Amir al-Mu'mineen, salawatullahi alayhi, he once said to Kumay, you know Dua Kumay? Kumay ibn Ziyad was one of the devout students of Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. The Imam Ali salam, one day he took the hand of Kumay and they went out into the desert. The Imam wanted to have a private conversation with him. Because not, you know, not everyone has the capacity to receive the knowledge of Amir al muminin The Imam says, Ya Kumay, inna hadihi al-qulub aw'iyah. O oh, Kumail, these hearts are receptacles. They are vessels. The best hearts are the ones that are the biggest vessels, that have the most potential, that have the most capacity to receive knowledge. But the question is, how do we increase our capacity? The way we increase it is that we avoid sin. We obey Allah. Because when you submit to God, the heart opens. Rabbi shrah li sladri. Oh Allah, expand my heart. This was the dua of Musa. You have to make dua for these things, brothers and sisters. You know, dunya, you know, most of the time when we make dua, we pray for what? We pray for dunyawi things. We pray for material things. Dunya is something that's insignificant because Allah gives it to even his enemies. But in Shirah al-Sadr is something that he gives to Musa. He gives to the Prophet. Alam nashrah laka sadrak. 
You have to ask Allah to increase your capacity. So this is something that we have to keep in mind. That in spirituality, we're trying to increase our capacity to receive tawfiq. We're trying to increase our capacity to understand, to receive knowledge, to receive wisdom. And then in the next ayah, so we said, when najmi idha hawa, literally it means by the star when it sets. But when you look at the verses after it, Allah begins a conversation about the Quran. So there must be a relationship between the stars and the revelation of the Quran. Then Allah says, Ma dalla sahibukum wa ma gawa. Your companion has neither strayed nor erred. You know, it's interesting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the Prophet your companion. He doesn't say the messenger has neither strayed nor erred. He doesn't say my Prophet has neither strayed nor erred. He's speaking to the kuffar. He's speaking to the people who the Prophet's teaching, who he's preaching to. Allah tells them that your companion, your sahib, has neither strayed nor erred. Why does Allah do this? Some of the Mufassirin, they say that Allah wants to remind the people, especially the Quraysh, that Muhammad ibn Abdullah is not a stranger. The Prophet didn't come out of nowhere. It's not that this was a man who was living in Rome, and then suddenly he appears in Arabia and you don't know anything about him. You know the Prophet. You know Muhammad ibn Abdullah. He was born in Mecca. He grew up, his childhood was in Mecca. You know about his life. It's not that this is a mysterious person who has appeared. You are the ones who found him to be so noble that you called him a Sadiq al Amin. A Sadiq al Amin was a title, was an honorary title that was given to him by the Meccans, by the Kuffar, by the pagans. Allah says he's not a stranger, he's your companion. And he talks to you like he's your companion. Everything that he says, he says. He speaks to you in the way that a friend would speak to you. He wants the best for you. You know, in Sunni Islam, there is great reverence given to the title of Sahib. You know, Sahaba of the Prophet, Ashab. In Shia Islam, being a companion of the Prophet only has value if you obey the Prophet, if you emul emulate him. The term Sahib of a Prophet, to be a companion of the Prophet in the Quran, doesn't necessarily, is not an indication of rank or piety. Because Allah tells the Kuffar that you guys are the Sahib of the Prophet, and he is your Sahib. Here Allah uses the word sahib to refer to the Prophet's relationship with Kufa. That he's your companion and you are his companion. So sahib can be used even for someone who doesn't believe. If this is not sufficient, even if you go to Surah number 12, Surah Yusuf, Ayah number 39. Yusuf alayhi salam, he had prison mates. What does he say to them? Ya sahibay as-sij, O my companions in the prison. Aarbabun mutafarriqun khayrun amillah al-wahid al-qahar. What's better to worship different gods or to worship one Lord? They're mushrikeen. And Yusuf calls him my companions. My companions in the prison. Allah could have used any word, but Allah is trying to show us that companionship does not denote merit. If you go to Surah 68, verse 48, Allah calls 
Yunus, the Sahib of the whale. So Allah even Allah says, Fasbir li hukmi rabbik. Wala takun kasahib al hut. Do not be like the companion of the whale. So Allah uses the word sahib to describe a relationship between a human being and an animal. So from a Quranic perspective, sahib does not denote merit. It describes a relationship. It's only a meritorious relationship if that companion is a companion of a prophet and they obey and they are devoted and they follow the path of that prophet. So Allah in this verse, you know, when the Quran is being revealed and the prophet is reciting these verses, how are the Meccans responding? They're calling him a liar. They're calling him a magician. They're trying to discredit him. They're engaging in character assassination. Allah says, ma dalla sahibukum wa ma gawa. That your companion has neither strayed nor erred. Two words are mentioned. Ma dalla. He's not in a state of dalal. Wa ma gawa. Some of the Mufassireen of the Qur'an, they say Dalla comes from Dalal, right? And it's the opposite of Huda. It's the opposite of Hidayah. So to be astray, Ma Dalla indicates the absence of guidance. They don't, have, they don't know their way. And to err, Wa Gawa, Ma Dalla Sahibukum Wa Ma Gawa, means and the opposite of gawa is rushd rushd means sound judgment so here allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so the prophet is guided because he's not dal and he's rashid because he's not gawi meaning the prophet is guided and he has sound judgment he doesn't sin and he doesn't make mistakes. So here, this verse is a declaration of the Prophet's infallibility. Because every sin is dalala. But not only does Allah negate sin from the Prophet, He says, Ma dalla sahibukum wa ma gawa. He doesn't even make errors in judgment. Everything that He does. There's wisdom behind it. You know, it's one thing to not sin, but you make you may make errors in judgment. Allah says, Ma dalla sahibukum. The opposite of dalla is huda. The opposite of wa ma gawa is rushd. To be rashid, to have good judgment. So the Prophet is protected from deviation, he's guided, and he's protected from errors in judgment he doesn't make mistakes in his judgment allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places a lot of importance on establishing the prophet's credibility credibility is important brothers and sisters when you're in a leadership position and this ayah is reminding us that if you want to be a leader you will not be effective if you don't have credibility. You have to make sure that you have a clean past. You know, some people say that, oh, the past is the past. Yeah, if you're not in a leadership position, the past is the past. It's not that much of a big deal. But when you're a leader, your past matters, right? That's why, it, you know, in political campaigns, politicians, what do they do? They bring up dirt from the past. So Allah makes it very clear that when I send someone to guide, I make sure that they've never been deviant and they've never made errors in judgment. Ma dalla sahibukum wa ma gawa. Furthermore, in the next ayah, what do we see? Wa ma yantiqa anil hawa. So 
Allah says he's not he doesn't stray and he doesn't err there's no deviation and there's no error in judgment and even beyond that nor does he speak out of his own desire the Quran is not the prophet paraphrasing God's word you know this is what makes the Quran unique if you look at the Bible today the Bible everyone admits that this these are the words of human beings who are maybe inspired or they heard the message of prophets and they put it in their own words you know the gospel of John is in the words of John the gospel of Luke is Luke's rendition of the Word of God the Quran is not the prophet paraphrasing every word that he utters when he's delivering the Quran is the Word of God so this ayah implies that Rasulullah is not the author of the Quran number one and his speech is guided that's why the second source of Islamic legislation is the Sunnah that's why the Sunnah of the Prophet is important it's significant so much of our religion is taken from his way from his words because everything that he says is divinely endorsed now here the word actually before i mention that there is a verse an interesting verse surah 69 verses 44 to 46 where allah makes it very clear that rasulullah does not speak of his own accord he doesn't make things up everything that he does he does it under divine instruction everything is approved by god everything is guided by him the quran says allah gives us a a scenario he says if the prophet were to ascribe things to us allah is basically giving us a hypothetical situation where Rasulullah were to make certain attributions to God. He were, he were to claim that this is the word of God when it really wasn't. Allah says, if, if my prophet did that, Allah says, I would seize him. Allah says, I would sever his jugular vein. Meaning Allah says, I will end his life if he were to say something in my name that was not true. Allah makes it very clear that the Prophet, his words are guided, they are endorsed. So here the word hawa is again mentioned. But here the word hawa doesn't mean when najmi ida hawa. It's the same word, but it has. A different meaning here. This is what we call laf mushtarak. It's the same word, but sometimes one word may have more than one meaning. The word hawa here means desire. Hawa is an important Quranic concept, my dear brothers and sisters. When you look throughout the Quran, hawa is often placed in direct opposition to guidance and truth. So if you think of a spectrum you have haq you have huda and then on the other side of the spectrum a spectrum is what ittiba al hawa following desires following whims and this is why the prophet is worthy of being followed and emulated his speech is guided and he does not follow his desires you know this is why someone like him is chosen to guide humankind because he has control over his desires he has control over his nafs this is a very important aspect of the life of the prophet allah doesn't just appoint someone to just deliver the message and that's it the prophet is not a mailman 
He has to personify. He has to embody the message. Therefore, he cannot be someone who doesn't have full control over his soul. You know, you and I, sometimes our aqil conquers our nafs. Sometimes we have control over our desires. And there are other times when our desires overcome us. But the Prophet, he always has full control of his hawa, of his desires. You know, there's a beautiful saying in Nahjul Balagha, saying number 286 in the copy that I have, and it might be in the 400s in the English edition, where Imam Amir al Mu'minin, he seems to be nostalgic. He thinks of someone who was very close to him who passed away. Maybe Salman al-Farisi, maybe Abu Dha. The Imam says, Kana li fima mada akhun The Imam is reflecting on the life of a friend that he had. Again, presumably, you know, uh, Abu Dhar, Salman, one of these close companions. And then the Imam says why this person was so dear to him. You know, when you, when you hear about someone who Imam Ali السلام, loved, you have to ask what quality did this person have? That he became so beloved to the Imam that the Imam calls him my brother, my brother in faith. The Imam says, وَكَانَ يُعْلِمُهُ فِي عَيْنِ صِغَرُ الدُّنْيَا فِي عَيْنِ the Imam says, what made him so great in my eyes was that the dunya was small in his eyes. The dunya was insignificant. And then he begins to name and speak about some of his qualities until he says, he mentions another one quality, this person that Imam Amir al muminin admires. He says, and whenever... He was confronted with a decision. Whenever he was confronted by a choice, by a decision, he would see which one is his desire more inclined to, his nafs is more inclined to it, and he would do the opposite. He would go against his hawa, his desires. This is what made him admirable in the eyes of Ali ibn Abi Talib. When Allah says, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى This is what makes Rasulullah so great. He's not a slave of his desires. He's a free man. He's a liberated human being. He's an, he's an, an enlightened human being. Allah says, وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَافَ مَقَامَ رَبِّهِ Look at the reward that Allah has assigned to the one who goes against these lowly desires. Allah says, Jannah is reserved for you. It's a huge reward because it's not something that's easy. There are many people that pray. There are many people that fast. There are many people that go to Hajj. But how many people have the discipline to go against their nafs. How many of how many people have the ability to not always succumb to their desires? Now, الهوى, and then Allah says, "What in huwa illa wahyun yuha?" He speaks only inspired revelation. Now the Prophet ﷺ, obviously he was not the first one to receive wahi. He's not the first Prophet to receive revelation. If you go to Surah An-Nisa verses 163 and 164, Allah gives us a long list of Prophets who, who were recipients of revelation. Inna awhayna ilayk. O Muhammad, we have given you wahi. We have given you revelation. كَمَا أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ نُوحٍ Just as we revealed to Nuh. 
وَالنَّبِيِّينَ مِنْ بَعْدِ And the prophets who came after him. وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمِ We revealed to Ibrahim, وَإِسْمَعِيلِ وَإِسْحَاقِ وَيَعْقُوبِ And then Allah mentions all of these prophets. Revelation is not a new phenomenon. But the question here is, what is the method of revelation? How does that heavenly entity known as the Qur'an transition from its status in the heavens? And how does it transfer to this earthly world? What is the mechanism of wahi? You know, just like the, when, the, when, the, when the surah began, when Najmi Ida Hawa, by the star when it sets, now we know how these physical stars set. But how does the Quran, what is the mechanism of the descent of the Quran? How does the Quran descend into this lowly world? Because dunya is the lowest level of existence. How does something as lofty as the Qur'an come down into this realm? It comes down in three different stages, three different phases. So this is with respect to the Qur'an. Because if you look at the ahadith, it seems that there are three main phases that it has to go through until it reaches alam dunya the first stage deals with matters that happen in a realm that is beyond our comprehension. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Buruj, what does he say in verses 21 and 22? بَلْ هُوَ قُرْآنٌ مَجِيدٌ فِي لَوْحٍ مَحْفُوظٍ Allah tells us that this Qur'an Quran is the, it represents the knowledge of God, the wisdom of God. It is first placed in what the Quran calls a guarded tablet. Now again, Allah is using language that the 7th century era can understand. What is this loh mahfuf? Some narrations mention that it is a tablet. It is something that holds all of the knowledge of all of the events that will unfold until the end of time. It's not accessible. That's why the Quran says it's mahfuz. So the Quran is where in the first stage, fi lawhim mahfuz. At that level, no one has access to the Qur'an. The Qur'an still is not within the reach of makhluq. بَلْ هُوَ قُرْآنٌ مَجِيدٌ فِي لَوْحٍ مَحْفُوظٍ Then the second stage. So again, this first stage, we don't really understand what that is. But it's, the Qur'an says that there's something called لوح محفوظ, a guarded tablet. Then in the second stage, from the guarded tablet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala transmits the Qur'an to a more accessible location in the earthly heaven known as Al-Baytul Ma'mur, the erected house. Now, some believe that Baytul Ma'amur is an allusion to the heart of the Prophet. So what does that mean? That means the first one, because if you look at the Qur'an, if you look at Surah Al-Baqarah verse 185, Allah says, Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Qur'an. The Qur'an, it's in, in its entirety, in its totality, was revealed in the month of Ramadan, in the month. But we know that within the month of Ramadan, it was revealed on a specific night. إِنَّا أَنزَلْنَاهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ الْقَدْ Now, you may tell me, where's Jibra'i? 
know, you and I, we have this impression that Quran is with God, then it's given to Jibra'il, and then it's given to Rasulullah. But that's not how it works. The Quran has to first reach the heart of the Prophet. So you may ask me, what is, where is Jibra'il in the story of Wahy? The Qur'an was revealed to the heart of the Prophet without Jibra'il. To the heart of the Prophet instantaneously because the Qur'an was revealed in two ways. An instantaneous revelation in anzalahu fi laylatul qadr and then you have the gradual revelation of the Qur'an. And this is where Jibra'il comes into the picture. The third stage of the revelation of the Quran is Jibra'il coming to the Prophet with the ayat to deliver to the people, the ayat that were already in the heart of the Prophet. So the first makhluq, to receive the Qur'an is not Jibra'il, it's the Prophet. Jibra'il is basically telling the Prophet what ayah to reveal to the people. Jibra'il, his role is with relation, is related to the gradual revelation of the Qur'an, not the instantaneous revelation of the Qur'an. And what is the proof? If you go to Surah number 75, Ayah number 17, Allah tells the Prophet, لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به O Muhammad, do not be hasty in, with your tongue. Meaning don't share the Qur'an until Jibra'il comes. لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به It would only make sense for the Prophet to be hasty if he already knows the Qur'an. Because if Jibra'il comes, خلاص, the green light has been given to recite. It means the Prophet has already internalized the Qur'an. Jibra'il descends to tell the Prophet what verse to share with the people. And Allah tells the Prophet in this ayah, don't be hasty in reciting until you get the signal from Jibra'il. Allamahu shadeedul qawa, inshallah, we'll cover it in our next section, in our, ne in our next session. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad wa ala ahli bayti al-tayyibin al-tahirin.